Good afternoon. I want to welcome everyone. And I'm Jean DeMarco, co-chair of the Wildlife Committee, and my co-chair, Georgia Stark, is here with us as well. Before I introduce our very special speaker, I want to remind you that the Wildlife Committee is working hard to attain the Gardening for Wildlife Community Certification for Lake Monticello from the National Wildlife Federation which would ensure healthier habitats for both residents and wildlife. To accomplish this, we need at least 175 individual yards certified. And we have applications over here. Um, they look like this. And I encourage you to please pick one up, fill it out, and mail it in. Having individual yards certified ensures habitat for wildlife, including bluebirds as well as other birds, all of which are beautiful, a joy to watch, and worthy of a wildlife-friendly yard. Our speaker this afternoon is Clark Walter, who has led a very interesting and actually amazing life with many different interests and talents. He says he has led a Forrest Gump life among the rich and famous, without ever having become one and considers himself blessed. He played professional basketball in Europe, worked with the Cleveland Ballet to revitalize Cleveland, and headed the Cleveland Zoo working to preserve and conserve species and habitat with environmental education a top priority. He has also been vice president of North America's largest conservation facility, focusing on research in a free-range habitat for endangered species, including some of the rarest animals on Earth from Africa, Asia, and North America. He also makes rum cakes and sells them at Christmas, and I have tasted one, and they're delicious. Mm -hmm. And he just told me that two years ago he biked 7,000 miles in the United States. Clark is a Virginia master naturalist and bluebird trail monitor. He was Virginia Bluebird Society's Volunteer of the Year in 2016, which is also the year that he designed and built Lake Monticello's Bluebird Boxes, enabling us to start a bluebird trail on the golf course. The 25 bluebird boxes are monitored weekly from February to September by members of the Wildlife Committee Georgia and Kathy and volunteer Jack Day. And um, this year so far, they've been 153 eggs, 31 hatchlings. There are now 37 eggs, and there have been 18 fledglings in all, with 66 bluebirds fledged and 19 tree, stalos, tree swallows fledged. Yes, Georgia? 85 fledglings. 85 fledglings, okay. And um, every fall, Clark builds numerous bluebird boxes, as many as 700 for a great number of people, selling them at cost. It's a real labor of love. So we're fortunate to have Clark with us this afternoon, and I will now turn the program over to him. Thank you. That's very kind. I'm so unworthy. Welcome. So I think Lake Monticello is just achieving miracles. I'm just so amazed at what you do and your commitment to conservation and uh, the programs you have here. So at, at one time, I was really fluent in exotic language of animals and flora and fauna from Africa, Asia, and South America, but I didn't know what was in my own backyard. Uh, so I, ne I needed to address that. But first, why are we here in the name of bluebirds at all today? And the question really goes back 150, 170 years uh, to 1851 when house sparrows were introduced in Brooklyn 
New York. And 50 years later, they were occupying the entire continental United States. They are an invasive species that are also a very aggressive species and a competing cavity nester with bluebirds. A few years later, in the late 1890s, the European starling was introduced at Central Park in New York City. Just a handful of them. And they were introduced by a group that wanted to populate uh, all of the birds mentioned in Shakespeare. Imagine that. <laughs> they too grow vociferously, and those two species, by the way, are now the two most numerous species in North America of all birds, and they're both invasive species. So, in, because they were aggressive cavity nesters, from 1920 to 1970, there was a huge hit on the population of bluebirds because they were losing the competition for nesting cavity space. And so uh, bluebirds are simply not equipped to battle with a starling or with a house sparrow. So they're losing the battle, and lesser factors than, than the starlings and the, and the house sparrows were loss of habitat, pesticides, and the removal of standing dead trees that were providing safe harbor uh, for bluebirds and other cavity nesting birds as well. Uh, by the early 1900s, uh, they are now disappearing in the millions. And a farmer in North Carolina by the name of Jack Finch, who was a conservationist, just happened to notice the decline of bluebirds because he really loved them personally. And what he noticed was that uh, the tobacco drying kilns were converting to uh, gas from wood. So all these new stovepipes that are up there were becoming harbor for bluebirds who were attracted to the cavities. And they were dying by the millions. And by virtue of this enterprise in tobacco industry, uh, bluebirds were essentially driven to extinction in tobacco growing states. That just happens to be in coincidence with what also was going on with house sparrows and starlings. So, oh, Finch did another thing that was really pretty interesting. He, uh, he started spreading the word a little bit in his community. He got the people to put wire screens over their flue pipes. And he did something that was pretty innovative at the time, and that was to have pits of black rat snakes in efforts to test for predator guards so that black snakes, as we all know, are uh, a predator of bluebirds to this day. Uh, I thought that was pretty innovative. Now, not a minute too soon, the North American Bluebird Society formed in 1977, and the Virginia Bluebird Society formed in 1996, and it grew vociferously. Um, right now, uh, the Virginia Bluebird Society comprises 491 officially designated monitored bluebird trails in the state of Virginia. There's approximately 5,000 nest boxes in 42 counties, uh, utilizing more than 1,300 volunteers in a given nesting season. Uh, in 2022, 18,800 bluebirds successfully fledged from Virginia Bluebird Society monitor trails. So that's, that's a nice contribution. So it is a fact that mankind's intervention is what saved bluebirds from extinction, starting with the modest efforts of Jack Finch. What a name, by the way, Finch for, <laughs> for bluebirds. Uh, his modest efforts, uh, and it, it's what actually saved bluebirds is people were starting to put up houses for them. They, some were poorly designed, some were a lot of them lost to predators and stuff, but still they were making an effort and it was enough to make a difference. And so that continuing man's intervention, bluebirds are highly reliant on people 
to put up those spaces for them. And that is what is indeed saving bluebirds. Now, the lesser factors I mentioned, like standing dead trees, known as snags, for example, are continued to be an issue for all birds, including bluebirds. And that there's a remarkable statistic that 85 species of birds, 35 cavity nesting, 35 of which occur here in the Northeast, uh, use cavities in those dead deteriorating trees. So standing dead trees provide valuable nesting shelter and feeding sites. Now, I wanted to tell you about some of the materials I'm going to lay out on the table for you. This is a sign-up sheet, and anything that we discuss here today that you see or didn't see and want a copy of, <clears throat> or you have questions that somehow didn't get answered, uh, or you have some way you want to talk to me about bluebirds in any respect, just sign up and put your name, your email address, and some notion of what it is you want me to do, and I will do it. It shall be so. So that is here. <clears throat> this, and if we run out of these signups, <laughs> but we probably won't, uh, if we run out of anything, just make a note and I will send you a copy. Uh, this is a stack of bluebird resources, starting with the Virginia Bluebird Society and others, including my email address, so that if you want more information about anything we talk about today or didn't, you can get it through this. So this is available for you. We will soon be talking about this, the Carl Little Nest Box Design, the recommended and approved Bluebird Nest Box Design by the Virginia Bluebird Society. I've included plans for any industrious among you who would like to take a hand in building your own. So these are detailed plants. They're here and they've been autographed by Carl Little, but that's another story. And you'll wonder why I said that in a minute. And then the baffled predator guards, there are plans here also from the Virginia Bluebird Society on how to construct these poles and baffles, which are so essential to the safety of bluebirds. Studies done in Albemarle County by the Virginia Bluebird Society years ago tested bluebird houses mounted on poles, sheds, trees, versus those mounted with the pole and baffle predator guard. And those without the pole and baffle were suffering on average a 50% mortality rate from predators. So if you put your bluebird box up, it may be there good for a year or two, but predators will eventually find it, whether you have a pole and baffle or not. A pole and baffle will stop 90% of all ground-braced predators, squirrels, raccoons, possums, uh, snakes, and snakes are a big threat. It will not stop a black bear. Uh, and while we're on the subject, I'll just show you this custom-made pole, which I make these and drill them, prepare them. It, it was customized by a bear who takes this one inch steel EMT electrical conduit and just bend it over double to the ground to bat the house open. So, um, but this is what the pole looks like and it has a threaded rod through here. And then the baffle. slides over and now when you sink it to a depth of 18 inches marked by that line the house resulting height of the house will be at a height where you can get into it to clean it out or to look and see what's going on otherwise it's going to be higher than you can reach so that's for your convenience and then the house mounts through this hole here into the back and secures on the back of the pole so, I would recommend poles and baffles to you simply because that's what I've learned on my own trail. 
is you, you need them. And uh, otherwise, you're going to have losses. But if you're OK with that, then that's OK. But if you're not, then you're going to want to pull and baffle. Now, the one exception to this baffle is that if a, a very large, determined black snake can get around that baffle, and they have. <clears throat> and there are certain areas of the state where they are a problem, and they require an 8-inch diameter baffle, and that stops them. OK, also available here in my shameless self-promotion, this is an article I was asked to write. <laughs> for the North American Bluebird Society. And it tells the story of uh, how I got involved with bluebirds, which I'm going to tell you uh, my own version uh, pretty soon here. But this is available if you want it. And then finally, there are five species of birds that are likely to occupy a Carl Little nest box uh, in the state of Virginia. And these, this is a photographs of those, what their eggs look like, and what their nests look like, in case you have any curiosity in that regard, or if you're monitoring boxes and want to know what's in there. <clears throat> so eastern bluebirds can get in, and they are the most likely to in the state of Virginia. The second most likely are tree swallows. And in some areas of our state, including some in Charlottesville, uh, they have a lot of tree swallows. And it happens to be the one species of bird that you can set up. They will coexist, and you can set up a second house within 15 feet of the other house, and those two species will coexist in the same space. You can't do that with any others. So there are areas in Charlottesville that put up two nest boxes some for the tree swallows, some for the bluebirds. Next is uh, Carolina chickadee, those cute little guys. They build mosses, nests out of moss. A tufted titmouse. A house wren. House wrens we have a lot of in this area. And house wrens are tiny, cute little things, but they are they still can outbattle a bluebird. And they are ones that if they get in the box, they can kill an adult. If the adult is gone, they will peck holes in the eggs. They might pick the eggs up and drop them on the ground. If there's newborn chicks, they might pick them up and drop them on the ground, fly them into the weeds. They're protected, so you can't do anything about them. But this is one of the species where you can make an adjustment that where you place your nest box that will eliminate the problem of house wrens if you have a problem with them. House wrens like the harbor of shred, shrubs and bushes. And all you have to, if you've got them, that means you're too close to some shrubs and bushes. And in some cases, it only means another 10 feet away from that shrub and bush. You just want to get outside the comfort zone of that house wren. And once you've done that, you'll see your problem disappear. And finally on the list is the dreaded house sparrow, the one introduced. And it is the one species that can fit into this box of those two demon species. If this hole, this hole is one and a half inches in diameter, Exactly. If it were a 16th of an inch bigger, starlings could get in. It's that small of a difference. But house sparrows do get in, and they wreak havoc. And they are not protected uh, by law. And there are active organizations coast to coast, and there are people here in Charlottesville, that if you have a house sparrow problem and don't feel comfortable with it, they will come and trap them. and euthanize them uh, in an effort to get rid of them. If you're not comfortable with that, OK, then you, you'll coexist with house sparrows. There have been multiple experiments all over the country trying this and that that took on a sort of a rage at a time that this might be the way 
to stop house sparrows. Somebody developed an idea of hanging shiny washers off the front of the nest box might do it. And that sort of gained some popularity, but then it didn't work. Uh, most of the theories have not worked. Uh, there is one that gained some real traction, and it might have been experimented with here. I'm not sure. The two-hole variety? Yes. Uh, yes. Another designer, Linda Violet in Colorado, came up with a two-hole nest box that when a house sparrow got in here, the bluebird had an escape hatch out the other hole. And so that seemed to be somewhat effective, and it is still utilized in some places around the country. There has been, uh, one year I produced 150 of those for people that wanted to try it out, and a lot of them were in this part of the state. Uh, but the demand for them has all but evaporated. Uh, but the thing is, is that a house sparrow gets in, any chicks or eggs that are in there are toast, and, but the adult lives to survive another day. So that's, that's the benefit of that box. So all of these things will be up here for you to take if you want. And if we run out, I will send you more. Just tell me on the email list. Now, a little bit about bluebirds. Um, there are three species of bluebirds in the United States. There's the western, and there is the uh, mountain, and then our species, which is the eastern bluebird. And western bluebirds are west of the Rocky Mountains, and they extend from Canada to Mexico. To and they are often so above 7,000 feet elevation. Um, mountain bluebirds are high elevations in Nevada, Utah, Colorado, and Arizona. And eastern or central U.S. from Maine and Michigan, Wisconsin to central Florida. And they are also known to breed in southeast Montana to central Texas. So they have little pockets of ranges there. But essentially, there's very little overlap between the species. Now, what do they like to eat? Uh, they like insects. They like berries. Uh, they are particularly fond of mealworms. And if you know about mealworms or don't know, included on your resource sheet here is the mealworm website of your dreams called the Nature, Nature's Way Mealworms, a place in Ohio that has been around for decades. Uh, and their sole purpose in life is to sell live mealworms. Uh, and they get them to you. And I, I highly recommend them if you want to use them to attract or supplement bluebird food uh, in your area. Uh, they come to you live in a little bag. They're really nice and neat and clean. They're cute and cuddly. And you store them in your crisper drawer in your refrigerator. And it's perfectly healthy to do that, but some people have to get past that. And then uh, I would also advise that you know, I mean, they are cute and cuddly, and, and they're very clean, and you pick them up, and, and don't give them names and get attached to them, <laughs> because that, that's going to end badly for you, and you'll, you'll need therapy. Uh, huh. Habitat. Uh, a bluebird nest box, you want it out from under the tree line. And the main reason for that is under the tree line, snakes and raccoons can still drop from a distance or bridge a gap from a post top <clears throat> to a nest box. So out from under the tree line, as much out in the open as possible and away from shrubs and bushes. So if you're out in the middle of a big grassy field, ideal. Now, if you live in the tall timber, like we do out in Ivy, there are big clearings, you know, like this, where you can see straight up to the sky. And we have bluebird nest boxes in positions like that, and they're all productive. We have 25 nest boxes on our trail out there. And last year, at one point, all 25 boxes had a bluebird nest in it. So it's not like that all the time, but that was, that was a good week. <clears throat> Uh, 
Um, so they like also it's kind of what we would call edge habitat in the in the environmental industry. Things that are away from the big tall timber, away from the trees and shrubs and bushes, but somewhat close to it because they they will like a perching spot where they can get out and look back and observe their house from a distance. So it's okay that way. Now, why am I here in the name of Bluebirds? <clears throat> We've all figured out why we're all here together, but me personally, um, as I said, I didn't know my own backyard, and so uh, my sweet pea, Connie and I, uh, were accepted into the Virginia Master Naturalist program. And are any of you here Virginia Master Naturalists? Um, it, it's an excellent program. I can't recommend it enough. Um, but it, it requires intense study and lots of hours. Uh, but it, in the end, uh, it gets you somewhat equipped uh, to deal with some of these things. And they make it perfectly clear before you're accepted into the program that the expectation is after devoting three hours a week of classroom time in 16 weeks and multiple field trips and studies and lectures, the expectation is that you will continue with 40 hours of volunteer citizen science projects per year, plus an additional eight hours of continuing education that they approve. If you're not willing to do that, then they want to put their resources to people who are. <clears throat> so, uh, but even in spite of all this training and awareness of nature, I didn't have the foggiest notion about bluebirds and that it was going to play a very big part in my life, which it has. And uh, starting in 2011, as we're in the class, one of the sessions one night was uh, people coming to talk about volunteer opportunities that would be available to us if we got certified at the end. And one of those was Ann Dunn, the county coordinator for the Virginia Bluebird Society for Albemarle County. And she was looking to encourage some of us to gain enough interest in bluebirds to come out and monitor some of the existing trails in Albemarle County, of which there are 35. <clears throat> so I approached her after that meeting with the bold notion of how about coming out to Owensfield Drive in Ivy and let's look at putting up our own trail on the street. And she said, well, I don't know, let's go look. Well, she came, we walked two miles, and she said, yes, this is good. She said, all you need are 10 nest boxes. I said, I know a guy that can build them, I'll do it, but I, I need the plans. And she held up the Virginia Bluebird Society plans and said, you have to build this Carl Little nest box, and you have to have them all with poles and baffles and we'll get going. So that's how it started with me building bluebird nest boxes. And uh, I set out to build my 10. And some members in my class at the time, a Virginia master naturalist, they said, well, hey, we'd like one, we'd like one. <clears throat> so I did another 15. And I brought them all in, I gave them to people, and everybody in the class goes, oh, 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 we want one, we want one. So now the list goes around, instructors want them, other Virginia master naturalists want them, the rest of the class wants them, I did another 65. Okay, that was in 2011. In 2016, a couple stories in Seaville Magazine, NPR out to do a story. <laughs> um, that article in the North American Bluebird Society Magazine and I had orders for 750 bluebird houses <clears throat> with material costs with poles and baffles exceeding $20,000. That's a relatively large not-for-profit enterprise <laughs> and a lot to juggle. You know, there's, and there were people placing orders from all over the United States and they, they said, we'll pay shipping. So now you know, I said, well, I can't ship a seven-foot pole, but I can get everything else to you. And so, that's how it got started. And uh, I have since, because of that big year and the extraordinary amount of time it took, uh, I mean, I would say it was 100 hours a week for six weeks. Uh, and I made a lot of sawdust. 
Um, Sweet Pea and I agreed that I would cut it back with her help. We would cut it back to uh, 350 per year. So that's the maximum that I do now. And I take orders, and they, they're usually ordered very soon. <clears throat> so I'm going to pass these around in a minute, but I thought I would show you what it looks like when I build these bluebird houses because I've gone into an element of mass production, which is in my DNA. My grandfather was a designer and inventor during the industrial age. And he started a, there are things that he designed that are in your homes. And um, he started a steel forging plant uh, on the day the stock market crashed and uh, they, he was building and stamping out forgings for things that he had designed for General Motors and Frigidaire and Westinghouse. And during World War II, the British RAF. Uh, my dad, before he went off to the South Pacific in World War II, personally was stamping out parts for the British uh, Spitfire. And there was a big box of them left over that he gave to me uh, many years ago that I have in my shop. So if you want to see them, come to my shop and I'll show them to you. <clears throat> so this is what my shop looks like from the outside. It is a former garage that Sweet Pea says, you've got to have a shop. So I converted it. <clears throat> it is not your normal sort of looking shop because I added windows, a hardwood floor, and I said, Sweet Pea, let's make this like a studio because someday we're going to have to move from here. And, you know, a wood shop could be a liability, but a nice looking wood shop that could be retrofitted as a studio. So when materials arrive for bluebirds, and I take them in massive shipments from lumber yards around here, uh, this is the stack of lumber required to do about 200 nest boxes. I'll pass these all around so you can see them. <clears throat> then I start cutting up all of the parts to size, pre-drilling them, countersinking for holes and stuff because cedar has a tendency to split. So you want to countersink all your holes first. So pieces and parts stacked on my bench for 200 nest boxes. More pieces and parts stacked under my bench for 200 nest boxes. And now, nest boxes filling my shop. The workbench this high. <clears throat> there is literally no room to step in my shop except inside the doors. People pick them up and I eventually get my shop back. Here's another angle. <clears throat> And in this picture, you can see some of the two-hole variety that I built that year. Now, all of this inspired another NPR visit. And, you know, in my eternal quest for fame, it all, wor it all works out. <clears throat> Poles and baffles. <clears throat> my dad, uh, among, he was treasurer of the Alliance Job Forge, my grandfather's company. He was president of the school board for 30 years and a heating and air conditioning contractor with access to metal conduit pieces and parts. <clears throat> so I go to Ohio to grab four or $5,000 worth of metal stuff <clears throat> and bring it back to my shop. And this is one room of my shop where we would normally have all of our bicycles that has been cleared out to stack these baffles. And again, you can only open the door and pull out until you have enough room. <clears throat> This is the recommended approved design by Carl Little himself. And uh, I thought, well, that's pretty nice. And Ann Dunn gave it to me. And I'll show you what some of the features are that are really good that have been well thought out by Carl in his design. First of all, it has a large roof. And uh, so that dissipates heat. And that can be a particular concern in the really hot months for bluebirds because that's what renders bluebird eggs infertile. So if you've got a box that's really overheated, some of the eggs in that nest will become infertile. Uh, 
The other thing he did was to make it deep enough down here because birds of prey like to land on these boxes and then reach through and grab chicks and eggs or adults or whatever they can get. And by building, having a lower, deeper box, the nests are only gonna come like this. And by having a longer edge on the front, away from the hole, it gets beyond the reach of bluebirds of prey. So I have virtually no problems in 12 years of 25 boxes on our trail with birds of prey. I see them on the box all the time. I see, I see big barred owls that are this tall standing on one of my boxes or red-shouldered hawks, but they're not getting anything. Now, the other thing, you see these grooves cut in the back? See the grooves? <clears throat> that is because the second most likely species to occupy this box is a tree swallow. And tree swallows build a very shallow nest down here somewhere, <clears throat> and it's usually made of feathers and stuff. And the Virginia, they, they need these grooves in order to get out, the chicks do, because the, the nest is lower. And the Virginia Bluebird Society does not want to kill baby tree swallows in their efforts to save bluebirds. So they require me to put all these grooves in here so little tree swallows can climb out and fledge for the first time. Uh, also, the access door makes it easy to get into, clean it out, monitor it on a weekly basis. It's made of western red cedar, which is rot resistant, impervious to insects, and it requires no finish whatsoever. And I strongly encourage people not to finish them in any way and never, ever, ever finish them on the inside. But if you really have a need to get a, a color-coordinated bluebird house with something on the outside only. So then, now that you've seen the bluebird house, I think I'm going to demonstrate how I build one and uh, on a much smaller scale. <laughs> so I hope you're not disappointed that I'm only gonna do one today. And uh, let's see. I, there's one more story I wanted to tell you, and that is uh, when I started this and people would come, to, I made the requirement that people start paying for their orders in advance, uh, placing the order, and that was, there had to be some trust element in me to do that, but people did, because as I said, it was getting upwards of $20,000 in materials. That also helped assure that they would come pick them up if they prepaid them. And then that they picked them up. When I notified them when they were ready, I'd schedule them for a pickup. Uh, so uh, when people would come, I would say, OK, here's your order. And some person might get one. Some person might get 10. And I'd say, and you know you're getting the official Carl Little design. And they would all nod solemnly like they knew. you know. <laughs> Oh yeah, we know. We know who Carl Little is. So one day, some guy said, well, who was Carl Little? And I said, I haven't a clue. <laughs> and he said, really? I said, I don't. I said, I imagine that he was some guy who tramped around in the woods with Meriwether Lewis, who happened to live right around the corner for us on Owensville Road. And I said, he's a great birding man, long gone for the ages. That really happened. A week later, this really happened. There's a knock on my door, and I answer, and he goes, hi, I'm Carl Little. <laughs> what? You can't be. You're dead. <laughs> and he, so he laughed, and he says, really? <laughs> and so I told him the story, and he said, I said, well, what do you want? And he said, uh, I'm here for some of your nest boxes. I said, let me get this right. Uh, Carl Little, designer of these nest boxes, has come here to get Carl Little designed nest boxes uh, from me. And he goes, yeah, I like the way you build them. I said, how many do you want? He goes, 100. <laughs> 100? Yeah. So I see him and his wife uh, 
once a year, and sometimes they come with a big flatbed trailer to take home their 100 or 125 with poles and baffles, <clears throat> and they are populating the trails in Northern Virginia or replacing those in Northern Virginia that need them and stuff. They will hang off the hole, we, and we highly discourage any kind of perch because that allows other birds to sit there and mess around. Bluebirds will hang here when they want. They'll sit on top. There's, it's no issue at all for them not having one. And uh, putting one there is an invitation to other birds that gives them a lot of space to sit and think things over and make, think of a way to get a hold of something. On the trail, at the end of the never, I will take out the nest yeah. during the nesting season. So after the first cycle, yeah. which ended two, three weeks ago, I'll take out the nest if there's any nest in there. As soon as birds fledge, I take out the nest, clean out the box, you know, with maybe a little putty knife or an old paintbrush, kind of get rid of the debris, and then close it up. And then at the end of the season, I do that again uh, before the winter. And I will also winterize the boxes with some of the uh, foam pipe insulation you can buy at Lowe's in six foot lengths. You just tear it into pieces and I stuff the nooks and crannies in those places. Be because during the winter, bluebirds will stay in our area and you've probably seen them. And they, in the particularly cold and wet months, they will hunker down inside these boxes and they'll huddle in there with three, four, five of them. And uh, if you provide that insulation, it's very helpful to them. So, <clears throat> this is what I call the Bluebird Kit, where I take all the pieces I put them together to make sure that the wood is correct and take them apart <clears throat> and number all the edges with instructions so that they can be reassembled, sort of color by number thing. <clears throat> and I've done this for various organizations around the state that want to do it in a kit form with people who are not ex don't have shops or not experienced with building stuff, so they want it to make it as easy as possible. And in one case, uh, there was a school in Northern Virginia, a kindergarten, uh, back during COVID that wanted these kids. And they sent me these adorable pictures of these little kindergarten kids all wearing masks, <coughs> assembling their bluebird houses. And it, it was just terrific. So <coughs> I'm gonna use this as a model for today. Uh, to put them together because I didn't want to bring in a saw and all that stuff. You know, you wouldn't like that anyway. <clears throat> so when I build, um, I use jigs to speed up the assembly process. I'm doing it all single-handedly, so all these vast piles of materials are stacked up and they're ready for mass production. So to start an assembly, I have this jig that's actually screwed to my box and this will accept the back of this and the side. So wait, I got that back, I got it backwards, so I'm sorry. I'm confusing myself, which is easily done. Okay. I'm not in my shop and this is, it feels different. Uh, okay, bear with me and I'll be all right. Oh, that's because I had the wrong piece. <laughs> they look alike, but they're not. This is a, the side opposite the door. And I start out with this one and I slide it in there and that gives me a stable base to work with. I use a torque drive screw, if any of you are familiar with that. <clears throat> a very high quality screw that, um, that most people do not have the driver to do one of these. So it does discourage vandalism if someone wanted to play around with a box. And 
I start out with the right tool. Okay, that's the back on in this side. Now, it would actually it would come out of in the assembly line. I just flip it like that, and right here I have stacked up all the bottom pieces that are all pre-cut and ready to go. Now, during the season of building, I will go through. Uh, 40 pounds of screws. Um, it's just amazing. I, when I go buy lumber, uh, they will deliver my order in two or three truckloads. I will buy out everything they have for that week, and I have to wait a week or 10 days before I get the next segment of it. So I'm putting in the bottom right now, which is cut little corners for drainage holes. Next is the front. Scary, huh? <clears throat> this is called an impact driver. It's not a normal sort of drill. It's got extra power. It will kick in and do that kind of thing if it's feeling resistance. And you can adjust how much it, how, mo how much power it is. You could literally drive this screw right through this wood. So you need to be careful when you use these tools. Okay, so now we have the front in the back with the side. Okay, the next step, this is the door stop. And that will be what the door goes up against. So we put that in there, but we don't fasten it yet. This is the door. This door is cut an eighth of an inch shorter, the cost here for ventilation and the ease of opening and it's cut an eighth of an inch narrower also for ventilation and ease of opening otherwise it would bind So you want a little space there, and that can be even bigger. It pivots nicely. Now you line up the door and the door stop so that it is flush. You want it to be flush here. So you set the door stop where we do that. Now, you take the one Phillips head screw, distinguish gray, and everybody's got a Phillips head screwdriver. And this is the one that all the trail monitors need to know how to operate. Because <laughs> if you can't operate this screw, you're in trouble. And that is what secures the door to the door stop. Then you back it out. And you can use it as you can when I close the door.
I have many other jigs to speed up the production process as it goes around at my table and ends over there. It sort of reminds me of that Lucy, you know, baking cakes, you oh, know, yeah. in that episode of the year. Remember that? So, <clears throat> one of the jigs is for the roofs, and I use it first to be able to mark the locations of the holes. I don't want to, if I took time to measure 700 roofs, you know, I, I mean, so I create this jig, and that, now I can mark with a red pen. Can you tell I use red? I mark it with a red pen, then I can countersink it. Then I can also use it as a measure here to get this right and the distance so that these holes are centered over top of this. And I use my fingers as a guide to just give it a half inch or so of exposure and overhang. It's not a critical thing but getting it in line is. Now because I've already pre-drilled these holes, I want them to go exactly right, so I'm gonna do it this way. But normally I would use those jigs. final two screws in the shop once the roof is on at this stage. <clears throat> the measurement of these holes and the placement of them is somewhat critical because it would be easy to split this wood as you drive the screws in for this roof. So I wait until the roof is to this stage and then with a drill equipped with a countersink, just by sight I drill the countersink holes like this. Then I drive the two screws in. And then you're done. So, and it, after you do 700 of them, you get the hang of it. <laughs> you know? So. Then they go through a little quality control test. You know, I check everything for any screws that miss the spot. I make sure there's no split wood anywhere because cedar has a tendency to split. And so I always have a stack of extra pieces in every category uh, to account for that. Red cedar. I'm sorry? Red cedar. Yes, sir. Is that good? Yes. Huh? Yes, I use. I a couple of them red cedar. Yes, I, I do uh, Western Red Cedar. Uh, I get it from what used to be Blue Ridge Builders and now Cardinal Builder Supply out in Crozet. Uh, and this year's stock, by the way, has been particularly nice stuff. Uh, I get one by six and one by tens. And I take big orders and they listen to me when I go out there. You know, I feel like, you know, big stuff, you know, for a minute because, you know, I'm only doing this for a little bit of time. For so, uh, are there any other, oh, one other thing is that uh, I should have pointed out here. So this box here, this is the bolt in the back, and it would go through the hole in the top of the pole. And once, once you have the pole, you put the pole in the ground first before you do anything. And then you put that threaded rod through the hole. Then you put the baffle on, because it's pretty hard to put the baffle on if you put the house on first. <clears throat> then you slip it through the hole in the top. Now, not everybody's gonna put in a pole that's perfectly straight up and down this way or this way. <clears throat> so once it's on the pole and it, with this mounted, it's going to swing back and forth like this on the box. And you can move it 
and by sight, you position it so it's straight up and down. Then you screw this little EMT two-hole strap on it. That secures it, and then you're ready to go. Uh, which direction to place, face the Bluebird box in. And the Virginia Bluebird Society sometimes says northeast, but all I can say is that of 25 boxes on our trail in Ivy, they're facing in every direction and every nest is productive. Uh, so I can't say that for sure. Another thing they will say is how far apart should you put them? Nest, one nest box to the next. And the Virginia Bluebird Society says 100 yards is good. And probably out in a wide open field, 100 yards between boxes is good. But I have seen them work with considerably less, 100 feet. And uh, especially if you break up a direct line of sight with a tree or a building. So if you have a front yard and a backyard, you know, with a, with a small space that you can put them in and get away from your house and bushes and stuff on both sides, that's okay, because it works. It works on our trail in, in Ivy very well. So when you sink the pole in the ground, uh, pole pounder's the best thing. You don't need a post hole digger or digging. And do you know what a pole pounder is? They are those two-handled things that weigh about 20 pounds, and you kind of wham, wham, wham. And literally, it's a 10-second enterprise, uh, unless you run into a rock or a root, and then you got to move the pole a little bit. But you know, it's going to be over in a hurry with a pole pounder. Then, only then do you put this threaded rod through and put the nut on either side because otherwise you're going to smash it with the pole pounder. Then you ask me how I know that. And then, uh, I have a lot of experience doing things the wrong way the first or second time. All right, we'll leave that off for now, but you know where it goes. Uh, keep the pole up. Then uh, you face this hole. Oh, a block of wood and a hammer. And most of you are going to need some little step stool or something to do it. Because uh, these poles are cut to seven feet. Uh, that would do it. Face that top hole in the direction you want the house to face when you're done. Then you put this. Right through the hole like that. You got it good? Okay because I'm going to do a little quick surgery here. like one of those assistants in a magic show. Yeah, I really you will. <laughs> well, we're, we're going to cut you in half in a minute. <laughs> you okay with that? <laughs> right. So see how it swivels up here once it's on the post. Mm. Then you can. Then you drop <laughs> in the grass. Oh, I'm a repeat <laughs> offender. Look at this. So. You, you, you position this, you know, by sight, straight up and down, fasten that over, and pop in these two little wood screws. Does that answer it? Does, yeah? You're very welcome. Squirrels are, if it is a squirrel, there's, there's very little you can do to stop them, maybe other than shoot them. I mean, because they are persistent buggers, and I have tried various things in a variety of situations with squirrels, and they've entertained me immensely. <clears throat> Incredibly. I had one that was getting to a, a bird feeder on the side of our house, right outside the window. <clears throat> I tried every device known to man to stop this squirrel. I tried creating hazards in the way, everything <laughs> to stop this squirrel. 
And one day he's out there watching on the bird feeder, and I have one of those little extender things with a pistol grip that you can get things off a shelf with, like this, you know what I'm talking about? They used them in the old time grocery stores. I have one, and you can turn the head of it so sometimes it pinches like this or it pinches like this. So I turned it like this. My son was visiting at the time, and I said, watch this. <clears throat> I said, open the window. Uh, by the computer there and he opened the window and I reached out and I made a grab for the squirrel with one of these things. <clears throat> Believe it or not, I caught him right here. I was not hurting him because the little pinchers were wide enough. But he was there, <coughs> right there. No, not on his I'm sorry, under his shoulders, under his arms. And I brought him in and I just said, now look, you stay away from our bird feet. <laughs> It didn't work. <laughs> so one way to stop the holes, some people will craft a metal thing exactly an inch and a half around and screw it to the front of the house. Or they'll make a second opening an inch and a half out of wood that makes the depth of that hole a little bit bigger. <clears throat> but it covers up the part that's been eaten out. And you put in four screws with a little square thing with an inch and a half hole through it. So that's one remedy for that. Yeah, we, we had the bluebird that chased the squirrel. Squirrels in the yard by the nest, and that bluebird would go down and peck at that squirrel. The squirrel would take off. Yeah. We had so the squirrel would come up the fence down on there. By the bluebird house, he'd go down off the fence, go back up, come up the other side, go along. He would go around the bluebird house. But that bird chased that squirrel around the yard. Yeah. He didn't want it near the nest. It is amazing what they will do. Yes, sir. So I take it the squirrel's eating near the hole, not the roof, is eating the hole? That's, so, that's what I will typically see, is that something is eating around the hole or chewing, and it usually is a squirrel, because they're about the only thing that has a chance of getting past the baffle bit. Can you, if, you put like hardware cloth or anything there to discourage it, or? It, what what, what it works? It the bird, obviously. Yeah. I, you put metal around the hole of some kind uh, to reshape it. If you've got a baffle predator guard, you shouldn't be. Do you have a baffle predator guard on yours? That's probably why then, because that's what I'd recommend. I'm sorry, I'd love to give you a very definitive, precise answer. No, I'm, just curious, I'm just curious. You said you tried everything. <laughs> yeah. I, I've, yes. I, I love them. I, I paid a lot of money for a guaranteed, guaranteed money back guarantee squirrel feeder that was squirrel proof. I mean, bird feeder that was squirrel proof with a little twist on house lid that came off and they had to twist it back in a certain way. And, and we got it down at uh, Southern States and it was $65. That's a lot for a bird feeder. And we put it up and came home one day, and the squirrel was sitting inside of it with his head, you know, popped out of the top, you know, munching away. So. They did that tower. They took the, the lid right off and just sat in there. And... I mean, what are you going to do? Well, we are the peaceable kingdom, so we, we try and get along with as many as we can, you know. Okay, well, thank you very, very much. Um, and we do have something we want to give you. A hundred orders. <laughs> <laughs> First, a little something my husband made for you from the wildlife. Oh, that's terrific. Oh. <laughs> Isn't that neat? That will go up in my shop for sure. <clears throat> and oh, we have that holy, for you. oh, thank you. Oh. Thank you so much. That's very nice. Thank you all. It's very nice. Wow. I, I, you are all invited uh, to attend my shop anytime you want. <laughs> Thank you again. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. Yes, thank you.